Patience is a virtue. Not right now it isn't. Nothing says romance like the gift of a kidnapped, injured woman. Life finds a way. So, pretty much touch anything and get your head chopped off. I hereby christen this budget Barbie camper Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. Welcome back to the Adventurelings, where, with the right mental gymnastics, anything can be an adventure movie. <laughs> I am joined, as always, by my lovely sister, Emily. Hello. Emily, how are you doing today? I am doing very well. I am super excited about this movie, and I'll let you explain why, but yeah, just get that out there. I'm stoked. We have a bit of a role reversal. Earlier in the season, Emily was the one picking a lot of the films that we were diving into. This time, it's the other way around. I have chosen a movie for Emily to watch that I have seen and she hasn't, and that is Hunt for the Wilder People. The 2016 Taika Waititi movie that I love very much, and I really hope that you are able to enjoy as well. I am sure that I will. I watched the trailer, and honestly, like, it looks kind of right up my alley. Tonally, it seems in line with kind of what I'd expect from Taika Waititi. It seems like there are a lot of these beautiful sort of green outdoor foresty scenes, a lot of car crashes or cars bouncing around, basically. Yep. And then, of course, Sam Neill, who I love. And then a kid that seems very funny. So I'm excited. Yeah. You mentioned the Sam Neill guy, and he has been <laughs> on the show before. And apparently we have quite the affinity for him, especially as a begrudging father figure. Yeah. <laughs> and so he's kind of reprising his role from Jurassic Park, but, you know, in a very different way. So Yeah, he's grumpier, it seems. Yeah. <laughs> so you mentioned Taika, and our listeners probably know him from things more like Thor Ragnarok or Thor Love and Thunder <laughs> or <laughs> lots of Thor things, but also Just the Thors, generally. what we do in the shadows, Jojo Rabbit, mm -hmm. things like that. But yeah, where did you start your journey with Taika? Oh, goodness. I think it would be... I probably have a similar early exposure to a lot of people, maybe a little Flight of the Concords, definitely what we do in the shadows, mm -hmm. both the series and the movie. And then, you know, moving into stuff like Jojo Rabbit and starting to see him in, I guess, other people's stuff. I will say one thing of his, he's not in it, but he was one of the producers or I don't know, I think he co-wrote some stuff, but certainly was involved in getting made one of my favorite shows of the last like decade, which is Reservation Dogs. Mm. It is so good. Him and Sterling Harjo, and it's set in the US, it's set on a reservation. It is truly one of the funniest, most creative things. So I'm just, I love that show. I love what we do in the shadows. Jojo Rabbit is just its own thing. It's uh, fantastic and so bizarre. Yes. Yeah, so I have really enjoyed a lot of the more collaborative kind of the smaller projects. I mean, I certainly, you know, of course, have seen Thor Ragnarok and Thor Love and Thunder. And it's really, I've enjoyed his hand at the helm of those larger franchises. But I think for me personally, he's at his best when he's just making weird little movies with his weird friends. Yeah, I agree. I mean, soul creative control seems to be something that is really important to him. And he gets that when he's working on these smaller things, especially things in New Zealand, you know, where he is from, where he has all his connections and everything versus, you know, going into an already established kind of like Marvel universe, everything like that. I think we get some of Taika in that, but it's really in his truest form when he's the director, the writer, you know, the person putting yeah. it all together. You see so much more of him in that, which this movie, I think, does that very well. And <laughs> I hope that you agree, but... Outside of Taika, there's another major influence on this movie, and that is Barry Crump, who is this kind of Kiwi Crocodile Dundee type character. <laughs> also, I think he's got some like Hemingway in him. Okay. There's some really interesting tales about Barry Crump, but he is a very legendary figure in New Zealand, and if we have any Kiwis listening, you probably know this much better than I do. But yeah, he is quite the character. He wrote a book called Wild Pork and Watercress, and that is what this movie is based on. Oh. I don't know how tightly or loosely it is, and I really want to go back and read the book at some point. I say that about a lot of things on this show, but <laughs> in this case, it seems like it would be a really cool view into how this movie was 
shot and kind of the depiction of the bush in New Zealand, Mm -hmm. because that's a big part of it is, and I think this is pretty evident in the trailer too, so I'm not spoiling anything, that getting lost in the bush is a big element of this. That's cool. I didn't know it was based on a book or based on a true story, like at all. So, and I'm kind of surprised because watching the trailer, you would never be like, oh, I bet this is based on a true story. (laughs) Is it actually a true story? I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying, okay. like, if it's based on a book. I assumed the book was fiction. <laughs> oh, shit. I probably really? should have looked that up. Hang on. I assumed it was a memoir because if he's like Mr. Crocodile Dundee, but New Zealand edition, I just assumed it was like a memoir. Let me look. That's Googleable, though. It I'm is Googleable. And I'm going to do it. It just says collected stories. Okay. So Barry Crump is often referred to as a yarn weaver in this kind of lore that we have about him, which I think is a very interesting word, first of all, but I'm thinking that that means that it skews much more towards a fictional story, but please write in if you have better information. (laughs) We we could just read the book, but... (laughs) Could just read the book. (laughs) Yeah, we're not going to delay this episode in order to do that. Well, I don't mean stop it. (laughs) Yeah, okay. Well, we'll read the book later, but suffice it to say, it has source material, we do not know the nature of that source material, right. and we also do not know how... Why are we making a podcast? I don't know. <laughs> Listen, I just want to talk about the stunts. Yes. Okay. <laughs> anyway, but so what made you pick this movie? Yeah, so it is something that I have seen a number of times at this point and have loved. I think the character of Ricky Baker is very endearing. That's the kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Ricky Baker is the boy in the movie who comes to Bella and Heck Faulkner as somebody that's been in child welfare for some time, bounced around between families, all of that. I don't think I'm spoiling anything yet. Please stop me if I am. But Ricky and Heck have this really cool relationship where they're getting to know each other. When Ricky and Heck are in the bush, it's a really fun dynamic and kind of getting to see their relationship evolve over time like that's something that's really endearing to me and so without going too much into detail that's part of why i find it so rewatchable it's also a pretty short movie it's about 96 minutes total runtime outside of the credits and stuff but i can watch this movie over and over and get new things out of it each time and as is also often the case on this podcast, I wanted to watch it again (laughs) and share it with you. (laughs) Because like, well, part of this podcast is definitely sharing things that we love with other people. Like there is some satisfaction to that, especially when you think it's going to be well received. It's nice to share something that, you know, maybe somebody hasn't seen and get their reactions to it. So that's what I'm excited for today. Yeah. I'm really excited about that part. And I'm excited too, like you mentioned, you know, the relationship between Ricky and Heck. In the trailer, he's very gruff at the beginning. And then by the end of the trailer, we're having like car chases. So I'm very interested in like, how do we get from grumpy (laughs) uncle figure to cars flying over, I don't know, getting air and crashing, whatever. There's a lot in between, but it is a fun ride for sure. I actually really love short movies. So I don't know if it's my attention span or if it's just that, I don't know. I think it might actually be a storytelling thing. Like I just enjoy it when we can have a tightly told, compelling hundred minute movie or something. It's nice to me that you can watch a whole movie, stay engaged the whole time. You're not necessarily having to get up and go pee or starting to get antsy or bored. Or if you're someone like me who has... I don't know, way too much extra energy in my body. And I just start like, (laughs) my knee is bouncing and I'm like, okay, I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying this, but I'd also really like to move around. (laughs) Yeah, this one I think will keep you engaged the whole time. And it is so fun, so touching. And I am kind of ready to watch it if you are too. Let's do it. Okay. Oh, let's do it. I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that this is going to be a new favorite. Because if you love it as much as you do, because of course you've told me how much you love it Mm -hmm. outside of just our recording time. I have a lot of faith in you and your taste. And so I am really hoping that I come away with this with like a new favorite movie. Yeah, typically when you say that, I would say, oh, that's a lot of pressure. But in this case, I have all the confidence that you are really going to love it. So what do you think? I think we should find out. (laughs) All right. Let's watch it. Here is Hunt for the Wilder People. Ricky Baker. He is a baddie. 
a youth court regular. But we're hoping that this change of scene will help straighten them out. You hungry? That's a silly question, isn't it? Look at you. <laughs> Ricky Baker, now you are 13 years old. You are a teenager and you're as good as gold. Ricky, this is heck. You can call him uncle if you like. No, I can't. Well, it's on me to tell you that you should give me something to do. Is there anything you want me to do? Yeah. Leave me alone. Cool. You ever been up in that jungle before? There's about a million hectares of it, buddy. It's easy to get lost. You lost? Oh. I'm amazed how lost you are. You little oh. bastard! We got no choice but to camp out here for a few weeks. Where are you, Ricky Baker? More on this massive national manhunt. Faulkner is Caucasian. Well, they got that wrong because you're obviously white. You're going to jail, you pervert. What you call me? The pervert. Back up, homies, and let go of my uncle. So what do we do now? We run. Bye, 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 bye. Oh, no. No, we don't need to run. Huh? Oh, yeah. This is fast walk. It's going to be rough. No huts, no tents, real bush life. And if you play up, I dump you. OK, uncle. I'd still prefer if you don't call me uncle. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? What's the fastest way out of here? Jetpack! Can you share the jetpack? No! What? We're offering $10,000 to anyone who can capture them. Dead or alive? Oh. Alive. They should be alive. Crumpy! Oh, mate, she's a bit bumpy around here. Don't find that Ricky! 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 And that R2 did this? Tell them I was the world people. The water people? I'll never stop running. Yeah, and I'll never stop chasing you. I'm relentless. I'm like the Terminator. I'm more like Terminator than you. I said at first you're more like Sarah Connor in, in the first movie, too, before she could do chin-ups. All right, we are back from watching Hunt for the Wilder People, <laughs> a movie that I deeply, deeply love. And God, it was so good. A little peek behind the curtain. We had to take some time between the watch of the movie and the recording of the second half of the podcast. But the great thing about that is that it allowed me more chances to watch this movie because I watch <laughs> it like three more times, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It is one of the few movies that I really can watch just over and over again. It's very digestible, but then it has so many of the things that I like that re-watching it is a treat. And so the fact that we yeah. got that extra time, you know, really meant that I just got to spend more time with it, which is awesome. So this was my first time seeing this movie. I loved it immediately. I went back and watched it again the next day mm -hmm. because I just felt like the first time, you know, we were talking and I'm enjoying the moments and laughing, but I'm also, you know, it's just harder to really consume things. And so I wanted to just sort of watch it as a silent viewer, which I did. Yes. And I'm so glad that I did both because of the appreciation that it gave me for just the filmmaking of it, but also because there are certain things that I picked up on the second watch that I was like, oh, that's why. Mm -hmm. That's why that happened. Or that's why, you know, so I'm super glad that I did that. I mean, and just, you know, out of the gate, loved it. It's such a good movie. The cast is fantastic. One of the reasons you watched it the next day, I'm sure, is because you couldn't really hear the movie over my crying <laughs> and bubbling and all these things. It really is a movie that makes you feel a wide range of emotions and harkens back to the childhood of somebody that's really looking for acceptance and belonging and all those things. And I think that's something that you know a lot of us can identify with. It's also one of those films that really ends on a high note, and it's a feel-good type journey. And so watching it over and over again is very easy because you get to have that satisfaction at the end that things turn out well for Ricky Baker, and you were there for the journey. Yeah. You know, I think, too, one of the things that makes it such a satisfying rewatch and just original watch, like you mentioned, that it does have a happy ending, but it's not without its challenge toward the end. It's not a mm. perfect, like, tie a bow on it kind of ending. So it no. feels satisfying and it feels realistic. You're just glad that they made it to a good place. Even though, <laughs> spoiler, it is after Heck goes to jail for a while. <laughs> it is. But yeah, it works out well. <laughs> Heck does go to prison for being a, a molesterer. <laughs> But he's not actually a molesterer. Yeah, I feel like I should caveat my laughter with the reason I am laughing is because Heck is so not molesting anybody. Correct, correct. Yeah. But that is what Ricky thought was the right way out of the situation oh, at the goodness. time. And we have to live with that decision. 
you know, I wasn't actually clear on whether that was what he was going to prison for. I guess I sort of abstractly thought that it had something to do with his original manslaughter arrest. But then I guess on a rewatch, he said that he'd already gone to prison for that. So I don't know if it was like absconding with a child in care or something, but presumably once they actually got into court, Ricky's not going to like make up details about being molested. So No, and we do get a glimpse of that court scene. And so I don't know if it's one of those situations where somebody has to go to prison. And it can't be the kid. (laughs) <laughs> and they find fault in, heck, aiding or whatever type of light kidnapping this might be. <laughs> light, light kidnapping. Uh, <laughs> Is that the title? Light, light kidnapping? Light kidnapping, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it seems like somebody needed justice to be served. Also, the country spent a lot of money on this. Yes. They called in the army. They had police and child protective services and all these people kind of on this manhunt for these two gents that were in the bush and (laughs) it's not easy to find two people in the new zealand bush maybe that's what he went to jail for is like misuse of government resources or something i also feel like we should have trigger warnings fake molestation that is true i apologize so for anyone that is bothered by that i am sorry but do be comforted that it is not real molestation in this film correct No real good way out of that. No, not really. (laughs) Sorry, I am sorry. (laughs) No, it gives us a good segue, though, into the duality of what's happening on screen, like the journey that Heck and Ricky are on versus Mm -hmm. the narrative that the country has about them, where some people see this as clearly Heck is in the wrong, you know, he's... Taken a child. Kidnapped or gaslit or whatever this child into being his partner in crime versus those people that see them as outlaws that are fighting for freedom, that are anti-establishment, and want to see them continue this run as long as it will go. Mm -hmm. And I think we get a glimpse of how long it was when they say they've been on the run for about four months. They don't give an official time. I don't think that they were officially on the run, but if it was four months and then they had some time after that, like we've got to think this was six months Plus of them being able to live off the land and evade. And there were also people that were trying to get to them for the bounty since there was a $10,000 reward, I guess. Yeah, dead or alive. (laughs) Definitely alive. (laughs) Yeah. You know, it is interesting. Now that I think about it, there are so many prosecutable offenses because it could be like, I don't know, keeping a kid out of school, which is a thing, at least in the U.S., that you can get in trouble for. I don't know. He was only in prison for a year. So, I mean, I'm hoping that he went to prison for something else. Yeah. Uh, Something else. I might have to read the book to understand (laughs) that. Yes. Speaking of which, okay, so yeah, Barry Crump's book, Wild Pig and Watercress. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. We were talking about this a little bit yesterday just like when does this movie take place Mm -hmm. because the book was from 1983 did you say something like that? it was published in 86 but we have some references to media that were released in 1984 so i'm gonna go in the 84 to 86 region right they've definitely picked up on some of those vibes with the aesthetic of the film with the music even though the music i mean it does have some older songs but i think it's less literal but they did use like some electronic type music Mm -hmm. so it's interesting because it has kind of a timeless feel but timeless not in the i never even thought about what it was said not like that more like a little bit 80s a little bit 2000s yes uh, (laughs) you know it's a fun vibe it's true and you know if ricky had been listening to i don't know one direction you know it would have dated it (laughs) if he'd been listening to whatever is current now because i know that one direction is also outdated at this point (laughs) then yeah you would be really trying to figure that out and like trying to place it probably but since you have some of these 80s jams that just show up you're like oh this is great yeah Yeah. and then when you asked me that question of when is this supposed to be set i was like hang on let me think we've got elements from all over the place but the cars are new so (laughs) yeah yeah exactly so i guess so yeah and i like that approach that like instead of trying to make it timeless by taking time out of the picture altogether just be like ah throw a bunch of dated references at it and people just be like oh i don't know it just seems sort of whenever yep (laughs) yeah so that was a lot of fun but there's so many interesting choices the music i mean the casting is fantastic 
the way that it's shot is so naturalistic in some moments. And then in other moments, I suspect that it is trying to replicate how a child would see things. Mm -hmm. Like specifically the stabbing of the pig, Mm -hmm. like the way that it's cutting, like blood, face, knife. ah!" It feels like somebody, they talk about trauma memories and how your memory records things differently. And it's very choppy and very sense oriented. Yeah. Yeah. Some memories become almost caricatures of the situation based on what you're most sensitive to the situation, whether or not it is colored by other circumstances. And in that scene that you're referring to, clearly it is a bit traumatizing, but he also loves (laughs) Bella and is starting to understand what it means to live kind of on the edge of the bush and in rural life, Mm -hmm. all those things. Yeah. But it's almost certainly the first time he's seen something killed like that. So it just like hits in that particular way, whatever. They shot it in a way that really, like just in the moment, I was like, that's how that would feel to a child. Yes. But then it comes up again when he meets Kahu. And we should, I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves because we can do the plot summary and then we'll know who all these people are. (laughs) But when he meets Kahu, it's kind of a similar deal. Like it's cutting from her beautiful silky hair to the tail of the horse that she's riding to the sun and then things through the sun. It's very the same thing. Like it's shot in a very... Gosh, I kind of hate that the word sensual always means sexual or is usually used that way because I just mean in the way that you would feel it through your senses, Yep. the light and the motion and all of that. But those two were the ones that really jumped out to me as like, that is doing a really good job of replicating how a child would experience that in the moment. That is a very good point. During that, you mentioned that you have a plot summary prepared for us. Since this is a movie that is near and dear to my heart, I am very excited to hear kind of what you picked out of it. And we're going to get, of course, into that later on. But Mm -hmm. I would love to hear this plot summary. You ready for it? I am. Okay. I'm so tempted to do an accent during it, but (laughs) I can't sustain it for the whole thing. And I think, therefore, I should not sustain it for any of the thing. Does it at all involve Peter Jackson? Peter Jackson. No. Oh, well then. But it does involve Ricky Baker being a bad egg. (laughs) Okay, Okay, well, maybe that's all the accent that we need. That's that's all the (laughs) accent we need. It for sure is. Okay. Okay. Everybody comfortable? Cell phone's off, right? Okay, here we go. Spitting. Throwing rocks. Kicking stuff. Running away. Ricky Baker is a bad egg. Or so says the government. His surprisingly hostile child welfare services officer, Paula, certainly thinks so. But one brave foster mom, Bella Faulkner, is up to the challenge. Bella isn't perfect, but she is loving and accepting and takes Ricky with no preconceptions. For a while, things are great. Ricky has a birthday, gets a dog named Tupac, writes haikus, and even warms up to Bella's grumpy husband, Heck. But Bella dies suddenly, leaving them both heartbroken and adrift. When CWS notifies Heck that they're coming to take Ricky back, Ricky decides to fake his death and go AWOL in the bush with Tupac, rather than get sent to kid jail. Heck finds him quickly, but things go south when Heck breaks an ankle and they're stranded out there for a couple of weeks until he can walk again. While camping out, they get to know each other better, and Ricky tells Heck more about his life, including his friend Amber, who died in foster care. Meanwhile, Paula and the CWS, the cops, and all the media suspect the worst, that Heck has kidnapped Ricky and is probably a perv. Heck heals enough for them to break camp and hike on, making their way to a hunter's hut. After six weeks in the bush, it's a welcome relief, but that lasts for about five minutes before three idiots out on a hunting trip find them, and thanks to the news, assume that Heck is molesting Ricky. To be fair, Ricky says some stuff that could definitely be interpreted that way, including, quote, he made me do stuff, and, quote, I didn't really want to, but I had to to survive. Yeesh. There's a brawl, but they get away and agree that they should probably stay out in the bush to avoid the slammer. Yet Paula is in hot pursuit, and we get a fun montage of theft, news stories, hunting for food, SWAT teams in the jungle, and reading by the campfire. All in all, Heck and Ricky are doing pretty well. They even spot a bird that has supposedly gone extinct, and talk about getting a picture so they can get rich and famous. Before long, they spot another cabin and go in to clean up. Ricky finds some more books, but that's not the only surprise. They find a ranger in a diabetic coma, and Heck sends Ricky down the trail to find help. On the way, Ricky meets a beautiful girl on horseback, Kahu, who takes him to her house to call for help. Ricky books it back to the cabin in the morning, but finds the cops are there, along with Paula, who is quickly losing focus on the welfare aspect of child welfare and wants to get Ricky caught at any cost. She spots him across a small ravine, tints him with a bag of trail mix, accuses him of being Sarah Connor to her Terminator, and then tries (laughs) to get him to flip on heck. But Ricky won't do it because you don't trade family for anything. 
he escapes and finds Heck and Zag. Well, I'm just realizing now I didn't introduce Zag, but Zag is Heck's dog. Tupac's BFF, fellow dog. Okay, so he escapes and finds Heck and Zag, but it's not long before the dogs catch a scent and race off into the forest after a massive boar. They corner it in a ravine, but the boar gores Zag before Heck and Ricky are able to kill it, and Heck has to put Zag down. Fresh from another loss, they find a mountain pond with a waterfall, and Ricky anxiously shows Heck that he has Bella's ashes. She's been with them the whole time. Heck spreads her ashes. Oh, I just made myself cry there a little bit. I know. I'm trying not oh, to. Oh, man. I'm not even joking. I, like, teared up. Heck spreads her ashes down the waterfall and thanks Ricky for bringing her. Emotional catharsis aside, winter is coming and Paula is still after them. While fleeing the fuzz, Heck and Ricky meet a very literal bushman named Psycho Sam, who invites them back to his picturesquely moldy trailer. They pass a cozy night there, with Ricky reading Heck a haiku about their time in the bush. Heck says he likes it, which is the bare minimum of being supportive, but seems like a big step for him. In the morning, Ricky is outside writing and spots the cops in the tree line. They scramble to figure out how to escape, and Sam points them to his truck. Crumpy! Crumpy! <laughs> Crumpy! Sorry, I love Crumpy. <laughs> no, it's okay, me too. <laughs> we'll talk more about Crumpy and Crumpy's origins in a little bit. Yes, we will. Ricky hotwires it and takes the wheel. Now I feel bad for calling it an it. Now that I've given it a name, I've anthropomorphized <laughs> the truck, I feel bad for saying he hotwires it. Ricky hotwires Crumpy and takes the wheel. No time to switch drivers. Heck jumps in and they tear off ahead of the search party with Tupac in the back. Every time I get to say Tupac is in the woods, Tupac is in the back, Tupac is on the yep. trip, it makes me so happy. It's a great name for a dog. Cars, trucks, helicopters, and a tank in pursuit. They have an epic chase that dead ends into a scrapyard where they crash and flip the truck. Heck is injured and wants to give up, but Ricky is set on a final showdown. When Heck tries to surrender, Ricky accuses him of being a molesterer and shoots him in the ass. <laughs> There's no... <laughs> I really still don't understand the child logic of that. I don't know. Child logic is angry. The shooting part was mostly an accident, and I get that. Yes. However, <laughs> yeah, I imagine that Ricky had some grand plan, some vision how this would play out, and yeah. just was like, I know what to do. I'll call him a molesterer. And then it's like, wait, what? <laughs> what? What purpose does that serve? Yeah, well, like, he saw how offended Heck was when those guys called him a molesterer. Well, they called him a molesterer with only one er in the hut. Maybe he just was, like, lashing out with something he knew would hurt Heck. Or maybe it was, mm. like, he knew that Heck was so afraid of that that he thought Heck might stay on the run. Mm. I don't know. Either way, I don't think it's super logical. Right. But regardless, there's no way out. Paula runs in, and suddenly it's all, I've got the precious child, and not, he's a very bad egg, and give me a gun. Ricky and Heck are taken back to society, but things turn out okay for Ricky, who ends up placed with Kahu's family. A year later, Heck is out of prison and living in a halfway house. Ricky goes to visit and finds him sitting on the front steps, slowly reading a book. He invites Heck to come back and work on Kahu's farm, so they can find the possibly not extinct bird, <coughs> be a family again, <coughs> <laughs> Heck resists and then busts out a haiku of his own and agrees to come. Back in the country, it's a majestical golden afternoon. Heck and Ricky are loaded up and heading out to look for the bird, ready for another adventure together in the bush. The end. Very good. I am not sure that the plan of becoming rich and famous for finding an extinct bird is really going to happen. No, I don't think they have a very clear no. idea. Of no! Happens. Best case scenario, you take a picture of it, and then the place gets swarmed by bird watchers, and you don't profit from it at all because you don't own the land, you don't charge admission. Yeah. I just don't I know mean, where the fame and fortune really come from in that scenario. But hey, they're going to be friends to look for a bird, and there's right. nothing wrong with that. I mean, I think that you could make a case for fame, though, because if Heck and Ricky are known people who are on the run for six months together in the woods... And then the story breaks that an extinct bird has been found, and it has been found by them. Yeah. And that they actually initially saw it on their time out there, and then went back to find it again. I feel like that's hella good press. It is. That is very good. That's going on the news. But the fortune part, less so. I also like that you called out that as Paula is searching for Ricky, he stops being a child and starts being like this asset or this white whale for yeah. her and <laughs> the Sarah Connor. <laughs> yeah. And by the end, as you were saying, she jumps in and kind of like wraps him up in her arms. And even then she says, I've secured the package. I think yeah. not even like, you know, you're safe now or something like that. 
Yeah, I've got you, young man. No, and like literally minutes earlier, she was trying to make one of the SWAT team members right. give her, a child welfare services officer, a rifle. Yes, while she was riding a tank with a helmet on, like she's playing army here. This bitch is crazy. Yeah. Honestly, the character is really well written, and so I'm sure it would have worked regardless. But Rachel House, who is the actress who plays Paula, is so perfect. Yes. She is tremendously fun to watch. She feels ludicrous. It's amazing. Like, every moment you 100% believe that she's feeling the way she's feeling. Like, it's somehow, in spite of the implausibility of some of the stuff that she actually does, <laughs> Rachel House makes it feel completely in character. It's fantastic. I loved it so much. No child left behind. No child left behind. <laughs> no child left behind. No child left behind. <laughs> that scene is fantastic, by the way. And one of the things I wanted to mention, so for the audience, the scene that Mason is referencing is while Ricky and Hack are on the run, Paula goes on a press tour <laughs> and she's on the news. And it's also worth stating that all of the newscasters in this movie are real newscasters. So they just went to all of New Zealand's news anchors and were like, hey, do you want to be in a movie? Mm -hmm. So when she's on this interview, she's on with real newscasters and the guy's face is amazing. Like, I want to go get a screenshot of it because she's talking and she's talking about how he's a bad egg. And then the lady newscaster says, oh, well, you know, but he's still a child. He must be scared, right? And Paul was like, no, no, he's not scared. <laughs> and the man's face as she's talking and she just keeps saying this stuff. And then she goes, like Mason said, no child left behind. No child left behind. Even so, Paula, he's just a kid, right? He's alone in the bush. He's scared. Scared? No, no, he's not. He's not a scared little kid. He's a spanner in the works, and I'm the mechanic who's going to take that spanner and put him back in the toolbox. Okay. So where he belongs. Uh, all right. No child left behind. No child left behind. No child left behind. Just staring down the camera. Yeah, and the guy's face is just hilarious. So that, We will have to put that on scene. Instagram. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of great little details like that. I mean, it's not a huge country, you know, so I think it's interconnected, you know, the industry is, and it's really, really cool that they got all those real newscasters. Yeah. We also have the tie-in of Taika appearing in one of his films, which is not mm -hmm. uncommon, but right. he appears as a pastor who is officiating over Bella's funeral, and we get some interesting lines from him. Oh, man, the Jesus one. Jesus is tricky like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, yeah, the snacks through the door. You know, some parts in life, it seems like there's no way out. Like a sheep trapped in a maze designed by wolves. And you know that if you're ever in that situation, there are always two doors to choose from. And through the first door, oh, it's easy to get through that door. And on the other side, waiting for you, are all the nummiest treats you can imagine. Fanta, Doritos, LMP. Burger rings, Coke Zero. But you know what? There's also another door. Not the burger ring door, not the Fanta door. Another door that's harder to get through. Guess what's on the other side? Anyone want to take a guess? Vegetables? No, not vegetables. No. Jesus? You will think Jesus. I thought Jesus the first time I, I, I come across that door. It's not Jesus. It's another door. And guess what's on the other side of that door? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. He's tricky like that, Jesus. He is fantastic. He's so much fun as that pastor. And apparently that funeral is based on a real funeral that he went to. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> I want to know so badly what was actually said at the original one, if it inspired that. Yeah. Must have been fun. Must have been interesting. I have complex thoughts about that scene. First of all, because I love this movie so much that it feels almost painful to criticize parts of it, but... I almost wish that it wasn't Taika in that role and yeah. that it had been written for somebody else. Because for me, knowing Taika, knowing his relationship to the film and other films that he's created, I see him. I don't see the mm. character. And yeah, fair enough. I get his brand of humor and he delivers his brand of humor very, very well. But I don't know. It's a little weird think, yeah. to me. But I'm sure the comments section will roast me for that because he does do such a great job. I just almost wish it had been written for somebody else. No, I think it's valid. I think it's valid. I kind of get that. I didn't have the same experience. I think I had a little moment of like, oh, he's in this. But mostly I just enjoyed his delivery. Mm -hmm. But I think I'll think about that more next time we watch it. Yeah. But speaking of Taika, 
Apparently, he wrote the first draft of this in 2005 Mm -hmm. before he'd made any feature films. And he was actually hired to write it for another director, but it didn't get made. And so he picked up the rights and then he rewrote it for himself later when he was a filmmaker in his own right. So he has kind of a long history with this subject matter. But it's so interesting to me, too, that he wrote a different draft, like a more serious draft of it. And then when he finally got the rights, was like, nope, (laughs) go back and rewrite it in his own voice. There are so many stories of that through the years where I just so wish that I could have read that first draft and seen kind of what the original image was. I also feel like if I were to read the book, I would probably have a much better understanding of that first draft because in 2005, we didn't have the Taika that we have today. And, you know, it's very possible that he was trying to do more service to the book since it is a book written by a national treasure that it's kind of scary to make something like that your own, especially when you're not very well known. But now that he's been validated by other films that he's made and we know him to be this great filmmaker, it seems like it was less of a risk to kind of make it his way. Mm -hmm. But it was probably in 2005 it would have been a big challenge to take something like that that was so beloved and morph it into Taika's vision. Yeah. I mean, and speaking of beloved and Kiwi National Treasures, do you want to talk a little bit about Barry Crumb? (laughs) Yeah, I do. I mean, we talked about him a little bit in the front half, but we touched on Crumpy the Toyota Hilux, (laughs) which is a callback to when Barry Crump and Scotty, I have Scotty's last name, Lloyd Scott. That's funny. I just thought he was a character. I went back and watched the commercials Mason's about to talk about. Yeah. And I didn't realize that Scotty was a real person. I thought he was just a character. Scotty is the nickname for Lloyd Scott. And so they were doing these commercials together for the Toyota Hilux where they were going through these crazy parts of New Zealand, kind of showing off how capable that little truck can be. And so it was fun to see that exact vehicle show up in the movie and be called Crumpy, a clear callback to... Barry Crump and the work that he did for Toyota. Interesting fact, so there were a couple of cars used in the commercials for the Toyota Hilux that Toyota, many years later, actually tried to track down. And so they got some good leads on where they could find these exact vehicles. And I think they found one, but the other one may not have been well kept or wasn't kept track of. And so... Because they threw it over that cliff. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that good point. Good point. <laughs> That's a deep cut because you have to have watched a series of 1980s commercials featuring Barry Crump. Don't forget that joke. It is. But it is. Anyway, yeah. And another thing too is like you had mentioned, I think in the first piece, or possibly just to me in passing, but that the scene where Ricky is driving them there's a whole sequence that is an homage to one of those commercials. And so I only watched the commercials after I'd seen the movie and I was like, holy shit. Yeah. Like it's literally, it's a very clear replication of that. Sure. But I love that. And I almost wish that I had grown up in New Zealand to understand all of the things that were put into this film, because as I've researched it, every time that I've looked for something, I've found one of those deep trails that adds even more meaning to the film. And There are so many things that I probably missed not being a native New Zealander. Yeah. I know that burger rings are a beloved local snack, but I don't know what they taste like, you know, or anything like that. And I really (laughs) wish I did. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No, I mean, who among us doesn't wish that we had grown up in New Zealand? Yeah, true. (laughs) Speaking of New Zealand special treats... Like, he hallucinates a pavlova in the woods, which I think is pretty hilarious. Yes. <laughs> Along, of course, with the talking burger heck. Yep. Gosh, I mean, I just love was Ricky hungry. so much. <laughs> and, you know, speaking of Ricky, the actor who plays Ricky is named Julian Dennison. He found his way into this movie because Julian had made a commercial with Taika, and Taika wanted to work with him again. And just was like, I think I know what to do with this young man. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he sure did. And he is just absolute delight like he carries the movie i mean you couldn't do this movie without somebody like him not at all he even has a credit on the soundtrack because the ricky baker birthday song which is my favorite song Mm -hmm. now my new favorite song is the ricky baker birthday song was actually written by julian dennison and the actress who played bella rima tewiata i got it i think i hope it is such an inspiring scene too when she kind of performs that for ricky 
it makes me want to do that for my kids. Yeah. When has someone ever written a song for you and been willing to perform it for you and bake a cake for you? Bella yeah. felt so deeply for Ricky. And even though there was some initial pain in that relationship of trying to get him acclimated, see what he needed, he was very quiet and kind of distant at first. But she just knew what she had in Ricky and felt so blessed by his presence that, you know, she really went all out for these things. And so it was great to see her put so much of herself into that birthday, you know, mm -hmm. when he turns 13. And Aww. I love that so much. Like I said, I want to do it for my kids. I don't have kids, but I would love to write them little birthday songs to show them how much you care. Yeah, and when you have kids and you name them Ricky and Baker, and then you use that song for both of them, I'm going to tell them. Ricky Baker Winsour? Yeah. Ricky Baker Winsour. No, it's Ricky Winsour and Baker Winsour. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they're, they're twins, and then that's how you get away with the Ricky Baker birthday song. Baker is not a bad first name. Baker Mayfield, for example, yeah, but... if you're interested in college football. It's another one of those names that's a career, like your name, Mason. Yep. Mason, Archer, Fletcher, Baker, mm -hmm. all of these things. Yes. Anyway, you know, you mentioned that Bella is creating space for him to warm up. That He's taking a little bit of time. But honestly, Ricky warms up pretty fast. Yeah. It's really like day one that he's kind of distant. And then he's telling her maggot haikus. And he does do the runaway thing. Right. But it's not that he doesn't mean it. It's that he doesn't seem to resent it when he gets caught. <laughs> no. And Bella even is surprisingly cool with it. And I think she handles it the best way possible. Like, hey, are you thinking about running away today? And, then, yeah. you know, he's like, eh, maybe tomorrow, you know, or something like that. And it's just the perfect way to handle it. Yeah. If you hold on to somebody so tightly that they feel smothered and, you know, like they don't have any space of their own or mm -hmm. whatever, that they feel like running away... That's the exact time that you give them space. Yeah. And she does that. There are so many good quotes from this movie. And mm -hmm. one of the ones that I wrote down was about that. And she just said, it's okay if you run away, just be back by breakfast. Yes. Oh, that was so good. Are you going to run away tonight? Not sure. No, well, it's cool with me. Just make sure you're back by breakfast. Okay. So happy we found you, buddy. Sorry it took so long. Me too. Aw, yeah. Bella. And then, as you said, she gets taken from us pretty early on in the movie. And it has a profound impact on Heck as well, who really recognized who she was to him and mm -hmm. like how lucky he was to have her in his life. And yeah. so it was really a devastating scene where you see this outpouring of emotion from Heck and Ricky kind of standing in the background First of all, seeing Heck's emotion in that way for the first time, because Heck is very standoffish or arm's length-ish. That's not a word. Yeah, close enough. <laughs> but to see Heck and his love for Bella being poured out in that way, he may not have realized how much Bella meant to him until that very moment. And yeah. that makes it all the more special when he decides to take Bella's ashes with them Heck basically says, you know, I don't know what to do with these. We'll just put them in the box. And Ricky does understand what Bella means to him, I think, and what Bella meant to him in many ways. Mm -hmm. And so finding this mythical place of, you know, where water meets sky is really important to him. And, you know, we finally, through this journey, find our way to the top of this mountain where there is a really beautiful lake pool. I don't know. Pond, waterfall. Pond, whatever. Waterfall. I'll yeah. call it a pool with a waterfall. And they decide that that's the place to scatter her ashes. And Heck in that moment thanks Ricky because I don't think Heck knew how to process that emotion and maybe neither did Ricky, but Ricky kept Bella's ashes with him and then they found that way to do it together. I think that was really special. It is really special. And you know, I think Ricky is very intuitive about how he handles these things. Like, yeah. Heck has the benefit slash hindrance of adulthood, yeah. you know? So he, like you said, so Bella dies of a heart attack or something like that that was sudden and nonviolent while she's hanging up washing. And so Heck finds her and is just crouched over her body, sobbing, you know, 
And that scene is really brutal. But one of the things that really jumped out to me, especially on the second watch, is that Ricky immediately starts trying to care for Heck. Yeah. He's bringing him ridiculous dinners of burnt toast. I wrote that down as well. Yeah. Yeah. He's watching him to make sure he's okay. And I think it's the same thing. It's like Ricky is kind of instinctually handling his grief better than Heck does, definitely. There's actually a really weird and interesting part about what happens after Bella dies that I didn't pick up on until maybe the third rewatch. And that's actually that her casket is, I mean, first of all, she was cremated, but they still provide a, a casket for this service. It's made of cardboard. And I had mm. not picked up on that at all. Really, It Neither really is. And so I'm very intrigued by that choice. And then immediately following that service, there's another moment where Ricky and Heck are just so not okay. Both of them, they're driving back to yeah. the house and they stop in the middle of the road. Like, there's nobody else on the road. They can stop safely. They stop dead in the middle of the road, take a moment to compose themselves and process what's happening. And Ricky later on even makes comments about, like, it's okay, you're just processing, which is very insightful. But that is what leads us to the scene about Amber. But it's a really touching scene to see them both being so not okay at the same time yeah. and being able to sit in that silence, knowing what the other person is going through, not needing to say anything, not trying to comfort each other, just both knowing that they're not okay. Yeah, I mean, the rapidness with which Ricky bonds with Bella mm -hmm. and how much it must hurt him to think he has found someone who that relationship promises to be kind of the parent-child relationship that he's maybe been hoping for, and then to lose her, I mean, that whole emotional, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. it is rough. It is. And there are some things that I will not rewatch because I know that they have such a big impact on me. Mm -hmm. For example, I'm a big Buffy fan, but I cannot watch The Body. I cannot watch the episode of the show called The Body. I can't do it. I won't do it. I've seen all seven seasons a dozen times at least, but I can't watch that episode. In this movie, though, it's so much about the healing process and about how to be the people that Bella knew that they could be. And like that's why carrying her ashes with them is so symbolic and so important to the film that I'm on board with watching it over and over again because of the healing process that happens after and how they care for each other, how they show that empathy and begin to trust and rely upon each other in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But speaking of second watch stuff, another thing, I think I mentioned it in a plot summary, but when CWS realizes that Bella has died, they come to take Ricky back, or more accurately, they send a letter saying when they're going to come to take Ricky back. Mm -hmm. The first watch, I thought, gosh, it's kind of cruel that Heck makes him read the letter out loud. And then on the second watch, I knew why. Mm -hmm. So we find out in the scene where Ricky has escaped into the woods and faked his death and all of that stuff. Oh, God, that scene, too. Very poorly fakes his death. Oh, my God. Ricky decides, <laughs> I'm not going to juvie. So he <laughs> writes a suicide note that is hilarious, something that is not often said of suicide notes. He creates a fake Ricky in the barn, and then he intends to light the fake Ricky on fire, but ends up lighting the whole barn on fire and it all burns down. Anyway, so that's his reaction to the threat of going back to CWS. So he goes running off into the woods. Heck realizes he's gone and goes out to find him, to rescue him. And it is in this pursuit that we find out that Heck can't read. Mm -hmm. And Ricky starts making fun of him for it, which is stupid. And then Heck gets angry and twists his ankle, and that's how they end up stuck out there. At any rate, so we find out that Heck can't read after we see him ask Ricky to read him the letter. That is so interesting on rewatch because he probably suspects something, but he doesn't know what it says until Ricky reads it to him. So he's finding out in real time and watching his face on that second watch, you know, and then also knowing that he didn't mean to be cruel to Ricky by like, read this, they're taking you back. Mm hmm that was just a big thing that jumped out to me. Also, Ricky trying to eat bark <laughs> off a tree <laughs> when he gets hungry. When you're hungry and you don't know what's going on, I mean, you just try things. Yeah. 
Sure. So this movie, in a lot of ways, is kind of a series of situations in which one person can find empathy for the other. And, you know, like you said, at the beginning of that, Ricky didn't know that Heck wasn't able to read and so took something very different out of that scenario and then went back the other direction to making fun of him, which kids do that, especially when it's something so natural. Like yeah. if you have something over an adult, it's really like, oh, you don't know how I to play. I can do something you can't do. You can't whistle. I can whistle. It's so easy. You don't know how to play Roblox. Yeah. I know how to play Roblox. <laughs> Good example. <laughs> Idiot <both> adult. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And so I kind of get that. But then immediately afterwards, we get that, you know, the swing the other way of Heck has hurt himself and Ricky clearly cares for him and, you know, wants to make him comfortable, wants to go finding food for them. He's so sweet. Shoots oh, a I salad, you know, it's oh my so God. cute. Ricky is such a little caregiver. Yes. He really is. Maybe this is the whole point of the movie and I'm just getting it, but like... At the beginning of the movie, we get Rachel House listing off all of these, not just her listing, but we see get shots of him doing these things. He is spitting. He is kicking. He is lighting fires. He's throwing rocks at things. And it's an adorable sequence. But this is how he's presented to us. But what we actually see Ricky doing is accepting Bella's love, making overtures with Heck, but also giving Heck space without being like super, super sensitive about it when he needs it. We see him trying to care for Heck after Bella dies. We see him actually caring for Heck when his ankle is broken. We see him with Kahu and her dad and talking about his mom. He is such a sweet little kid. He ah! is. And in the face of so many things, like you were talking about Paula presenting him in this way as somebody mm -hmm. that kicks and spits and a bad egg. A bad egg. <laughs> that kicks and spits. <laughs> Um, you can't see it, but I just kicked a little bit. But as soon as they roll up to Heck and Bella's place, she basically says, no one else wants Ugh. you. Kind of putting this lens on who he is, supposedly. Also, and I'm just now having this realization, we actually don't know that he did those things. We just kind of assume that that is truth. But so much of what Paula gives us is a very skewed version of the truth to the point where he's about to get out of the car and doesn't want to. But she says, no one else wants you. Mm -hmm. And what a devastating thing for a child to God. hear. Yeah. And so we have no real understanding of his life before this, other than what we're presented through Paul's lens. We don't know the families that he's been with. Eventually, we find out that one of his friends in foster care was killed because she spoke truth about her family. Yeah. And to have that type of background and to have somebody kind of pushing you down over and over in Paula's character to still be able to be that caregiver, you know, have that empathy, be able to see people for who they truly are. All of that is really remarkable. Yeah. So yeah, he's a very remarkable boy. He is, you know, and another thing that adds to kind of the Ricky as caregiver is we basically learn only one fact about him that he himself shares about his past. And it is about his friend Amber. Mm -hmm. So when he's sharing himself with Heck, this is the fact he chooses yeah. that he had a friend named Amber that she died in care after, quote, telling stories about the dad and that he is deeply upset. I don't think he even says that. It's just visible that he's really upset that he never finds out what happened to her. And even mm -hmm. Heck is like, I don't remember what he says, but basically like that's super shitty yeah. to hide that from you. So he just knows she died and he doesn't know how. And this is the only thing really that he tells Heck about himself from his past. But a hard left turn. <laughs> Andy is the dumbest. That's <laughs> true. He's a great character, though. He's I don't mind. He's a great character. So Paula has this policeman sidekick named Andy, and he is so fun. He's so funny. And I also really love this moment. It's really early in the film. So we know that one of the bad things that Ricky does is kicking. And then we have this moment where Paula gets mad at Andy and, like, kicks at him. And it's so good. I love it so much. Yeah. Andy, even though he is a bit of a dunce of a policeman, maybe, or I don't know. I think a lot of times people like that who can be really wonderful people, you see them in the light of the other person that they're with. And so Paula being such a kind of bully type character, he could be a really great police officer. We just never get the chance to see it because... Yeah, he is the one who said dead or alive. But he corrected <laughs> himself. 
<laughs> he got it right later. Yeah, but he had to look off screen he to did. do it. It's he like did. somebody called it. Okay, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to Stop be being an, an Andy Stan. <laughs> He's an Andy Stan. Oh my goodness! But yeah, he seems to be a pretty nice guy and everything. But he does actually remind Paula that she's not a police officer on yeah. multiple occasions, mm-hmm. which I'm really glad that he does that. You know, and doesn't always just acquiesce to whatever she's saying. You know, when she's trying to turn this. Yes retrieval of a child into a manhunt with the army involved like all of these things like <laughs> he a... does remind her yeah but you're not a police officer <laughs> right yeah i've got the papers well done everybody now let's get this precious child out of here i'm sorry uncle no! i'm not your bloody no, uncle hit the faulkner no! you are under arrest no! whatever you do or say will be used against you in a court of law Paula. Police in New Zealand don't really say that. That's like an American thing, and you're not a cop. It's over. So Andy's great. He is a great side character, and he's a lot of fun. Andy, by the way, played by Oscar Keitley. Yep. One thing that I am noticing as I go through my notes for this movie is how incredibly quotable it is. Yeah. Think, Ricky, think. What would Uncle do? Yes, find water, and then go to higher ground. Don't get naked. There are so many, and I don't know why I always think of everything in this term now, but there are so many episode title options. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) there's a scene. Okay, so when they're coming out of the bush for the first time and they find that first hunter's cabin where they run into those idiots and then Heck gets accused of being a molesterer and all that stuff. That scene is chock full of lines. Yes. I love Julian Dennison's delivery on the Caucasian joke is so good. (laughs) So there's a poster that has them on it. And this is when they realize that they have become the objects of a manhunt. <laughs> He's reading it and it says that Heck is a Caucasian male. And Ricky is like, you're a Caucasian. Well, that's wrong because you're obviously white. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do that justice at all, but it's such a good line. But my favorite, I think, is slightly more nuanced. So the guys that find them are like digging to find something bad that Heck has done. And they're like, has he done anything to you? What's happened? Da, da, da. And Ricky is like, well, I fell in some prickles. And then this one guy goes <laughs> just quietly, like he's asking him something so serious. He goes, did he push you in the prickles? <laughs> <laughs> he hurt you, son? No. Nah, I fell in some prickles one time. He pushed you in those prickles? Yeah, probably. Did he push you in the prickles, mate? Leave my life. <laughs> no, that, just, that line just makes me cackle. <laughs> like, yep. Another really good one is the shit just got real, which yep. comes up a couple times. Also, let's just fast walk is another line yeah. that I really loved. <laughs> they're trying to get away. And yeah. They're running and they can't run. And then they're like, let's just fast walk. Like, yep. There oh, are many, God. many great quotes. So good. Are you going to manslaughter him? <laughs> you all right, mate? What's the matter? Ricky, you got to do something. Are you going to manslaughter him? Because I don't think I can watch. No, you idiot. you got to get some help. <laughs> that is also great. Yeah. I forgot about the that. stungray bit. The stungray bit is also really good. Mm-hmm. You are playing with a bag of snakes. That's another good one. (laughs) You're playing with a bag of snakes. I'm forgetting all of these, apparently. No, the I live here now, when they're in the bush, and he's just like, I live here now. You know, like, (laughs) this is my home now. I live here now. (laughs) That one was really great. Oh, good. You know, one thing that we both really liked during our watch of it was there's a scene or a part of the movie where it is becoming winter. During the actual shooting of this movie, they got some surprise snow, which they were not expecting. And so they didn't intend to shoot this in as wintry a uh, setting as they mm. did, but it turned out really beautifully. And there's this one arc shot where like the camera is just going around in a circle in this one place and it follows Ricky and Heck and then they go off screen, but the camera position is staying the same. And we're seeing the SWAT team going through the snowy woods and we're seeing Paula and Andy and we're seeing heck and ricky again and it's just like this really fantastic full circle shot like literally a full circle shot and it's really a nice moment i think that might be where my favorite part of the movie musically happens Mm. because they do pull in some you know real songs like leonard cohen's the partisan and in that moment it is the perfect song and i really really enjoyed that We have not really talked much about the music yet, but like you were referring to earlier, there are a lot of things that make this into a timeless movie. It's not super scored, you know, it's not dramatic like that. You don't have like Hans Zimmer horns blaring, you know, or anything (laughs) like that. It is very subtle. 
and it yeah. only ever adds to the scene, in my opinion. I can't think of one time where it detracts from it. Yeah. I mean, it is beautifully done. And it's pretty subtle, but it has its... Like, you like to talk about a hero moment mm -hmm. for props or whatever. I feel like this movie has a lot of hero moments for soundtrack, but they're still pretty subtle. It's not like we're going to throw this super recognizable song over this huge moment and it's going to cement it in your memory forever. It's more like the right thing at the right time. And they do that really well. Another thing that stands out to me is the textures in this movie. Mm. So that's, I guess, a combination really of the cinematography, but also of the locations and the set design. But the biggest one that jumps out to me, another thing we haven't talked a lot about is Reese Darby mm -hmm. as Psycho Sam. But his trailer is so fantastic. They show the trailer. It's covered in moss. It's like this perfect little set piece. And that first shot of it, I just was like, ooh, I can't wait to go in there. And then you go inside it. It's also really awesome inside. But I think Reese Darby's trailer or Psycho Sam's trailer is my favorite. I guess you'd count the outside as a location and the inside as a set. Yeah, I think I so. I don't know. Either way, it gets all rolled up into one and it is fantastic. Yeah. But you mentioned something there that I thought was interesting. We're in New Zealand, obviously, where such notable films as Lord of the Rings has been filmed avatar you know some other things and yet that's not the side of new zealand that we see like mm -mm. taika is not trying to make it look epic and everything there are some shots of you know very forested areas from above but generally he's capturing that you're in the thick of it you've gotten yourself into these thick lush woods and now that you're inside, that's the perspective that you have. It's from inside. And so certain things feel very claustrophobic or like you're trying to survive and you're confused and just trying to make it through. And that's why the knack is so important is because in the bush, when you don't know north, south, east, west, it's hard to see. It's hard to understand how far you've gone. Being able to find your way out of it, to find water, follow it the high ground and other things that we see playing out as Heck navigates the woods. And eventually, you know, Ricky picks up on a lot of them as well. But yeah, we don't have this view of New Zealand that is really for tourism. It is much more for yeah. like presenting that you can get so lost so easily in these woods. And then what do you do once you're there? Yeah. And yet, in years to come, when I think of movies that show me how beautiful New Zealand can be, this will be one of them. Yeah. Even though it's not about being these big epic shots. Right. Also, for the audience, the knack is a term that Heck uses just for, what, the combination of experience and intuition? Yeah, I would call it intuition mixed with survival skills. Yeah, so just having the knack to survive, basically. Yeah. But one thing that I was thinking about after you brought that up was there is a lot of contrast between the interiors and the exteriors. Mm -hmm. And that is both, I think, for effect, but also just realism. Like most of us don't live in huge houses. So when you're shooting in the interior, for example, of Heck and Bella's house, it's not going to be big rooms. Like they live in a small house, like mm -hmm. most of us do. The trailer, of course, feels very small. So there's the practicality of it. But there's also this really lovely contrast between these huge open places, even if the trees are feeling kind of close, the shooting of it doesn't always emphasize the size mm -hmm. of where they are, essentially, or the scope of where they are. But essentially, it's outside, unprotected, untethered, and then these very small little closed spaces, yeah. you know, inside the police car, inside Heck and Bella's house, inside the trailer, inside the cabins. And they shoot often from kind of under, shooting up slightly at mm -hmm. both Ricky and Heck, which I think is meant to emphasize that feeling. So I think they were doing it on purpose, and it works really well. Yeah, I agree. And that's about all I've got. I did want to say, Ricky is a surprisingly good driver. He is. It's true. Or maybe Crumpy took the wheel. Maybe Crumpy. <laughs> Crumpy take the wheel. That's what I'm going to say now, anytime. So Dave and I go camping, and <laughs> we often are on roads that are very bumpy. And there have been, without hyperbole, at least a couple of times where I thought, we could die. We mm -hmm. could die on this road. We could slide off this mountain. We could, whatever. And that's what I'm going to say now. Crumpy, is, take, Crumpy the take the wheel. Yeah. Crumpy! Jesus. Does she even go? Crumpy! Unkillable! Four wheel drive! Both wheels go, go four wheel drive! One thing that I wanted to mention too Kahu, one of the stories about her being cast for this film is that people went to local schools and, you know, we're talking, trying to find somebody that kind of fits the bill here. And they were describing the character of Kahu and. All of the kids at the school were like, oh, yeah, that's her. 
You, you don't want <laughs> us. We're not going to audition. The person you were describing is her. Is our friend, yeah. Yeah, is our friend. And I would not do justice to her name. I don't think I will be able to pronounce it correctly. We have to credit her, though, just because we can't pronounce it. Okay, we're going to try. I'm going to look it up. I'm okay. willing to take the hit. I've already messed up some names. You are a braver soul than I. I'll search to see if I can find her saying her oh, own name. Oh, Lord. Okay. I told you. Okay. You do that. I'm going to keep practicing until I get to the point that I'm, like, comfortable putting it up against a real pronunciation. Later that day. Did you ever find how they pronounce it, really? Nope, because okay. I think even during interviews, they are too scared. Because <laughs> <laughs> I watched, like, three of them, and nobody's calling her by her name. She definitely goes by Tio. 100% that girl goes by Tio. Anyway, mm -hmm. all right. <clears throat> Kahu, played by the emerging actress, Teoriore Ngatai Melbourne. I stand by that. That's the best I can do. I don't know if it's right or not, but it's the best I can do. And her dad is played by Choi Kingi. Her dad is another gem of a character. Oh, Lord. He is so funny. He's just, like, obsessed with getting selfies with Ricky and is utterly unconcerned that a missing child has walked into his home. He's just Correct. like, oh, Ricky, you're the best. Let's take pictures together. Definitely stay here. Hang out with my daughter. You can sleep on the couch. No worries. He's yep. not like, hey, where's the man you're supposed to be with? Hey, shall I call the police? He's just like, bro, you're the best. It's great. And I think that that's fueled because he has been listening to the voices that are talking about Ricky and Heck as national heroes, not necessarily the voices that are talking about them as being mm -hmm. fugitives and all that stuff. So like, by the time he actually meets him, he's a bit of a folk legend and he wants to meet that yeah. legend, take a picture with that legend. He wants to get him on his social media. Yeah, yeah. We didn't talk much about the dogs, but it is worth at least saying that the dog actors in this film are just doing a fantastic job. The dogs that play Tupac and Zag are just really lovely little puppies yeah. to watch. Run around. If they're listening in right now, who's a good boy? <laughs> who's, who's a good boy? boy? It's you. Who's a good boy? You're a good boy. You're a good boy. Yes. Oh, goodness. And they're credited in the, well, credits of the movie, but I don't have their names handy so i apologize for that yeah, i think you're gonna get a lot of grace for that one but yeah any final words on this film are you glad that you watched it do you consider it an adventure oh God, movie yes. yeah so i am extremely glad i watched it i will watch it many times i think in the future i will advocate for it this is definitely the kind of movie that i go around telling people like oh you should really watch that if you haven't seen it mm -hmm. is it adventure i mean Yes, yes. It has an adventure structure, largely. It definitely has the sort of odd couple of Ricky and Heck thrown together in a circumstance that they were not expecting. Yes, Ricky goes off into the bush by himself. They didn't expect to be stuck out there. They didn't expect to go on the run. They meet lots of characters that they didn't expect and are in situations and blah, blah, blah. So I think, you know, yeah, it is. It sort of the feeling of the film is a bit different. It is. I'll grant you that it ticks enough boxes for me that I put it in that category. And that's why I felt comfortable nominating it for the show. But I agree. It does feel different. And I think since I've seen it so many times now, and it's a very digestible movie, you can just sit down when you have a spare mm -hmm. hour and a half and watch it. It'll probably be different things to me each time. One time it might be an adventure movie. One time it might be a drama, a comedy, a whatever. Family dramedy. It kind of is a family dramedy yeah. adventure, basically. Family dramedy adventure is a perfect way to put it. But I think more importantly than any of the sort of genre lines, it's not sandy. It doesn't have British people in the desert. But they go on a mm -hmm. fucking adventure. They're in the bush for six months trying to escape the law and learning all of these things and meeting all these people. So, yep. I mean, I'm super glad we did it. I loved it. I'm so glad. I'm so happy. It's a risk. <laughs> you know, I think you and I've gotten pretty good at it, but it still feels like a risk yeah. to tell somebody, especially about something that you love so much, you know, you don't want them to be like, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that yeah, was... Yeah, I can see uh -huh. it. No, I understand yeah. what you like about that movie. Yeah, I mean, it is rough when that happens. Thankfully, we are mostly on the same page about those types of things, mm -hmm. but we were also produced... <laughs> In the same environment. <laughs> so, Forged in the I, flames of House Windsour. No, what is the Xena intro? Is Forged in the Heat of Battle. Mm -hmm. Oh, goodness. I watched so much Xena back in the day. Speaking of adventure stuff. But yeah, I'm super glad we did it. I loved it. For any listeners who are kind of on the fence about whether it seems like 
their kind of movie or seems like an adventure movie at all, watch it. Let us know. Yeah. Very open to alternate perspectives as long as you also like this movie because it's so good. It's so sweet. I, just, I, like, uh, I like that caveat. We're open to alternate opinions as long as you liked it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Listen, I'm open to I liked it, but it's not an adventure movie. Yeah. I'm open to I liked it, but I disagree about why Heck was in prison. I'm mm-hmm. open to I liked it, but... I think that Zag did a better acting job than Tupac. Mm-hmm. I'm open to I liked it and Bella should have lived longer. I'm open to I liked it, but I think that Rachel House was really the Sarah Connor. Mm. Yes. A whole array of opinions that I'm open to. Yeah. Well, I'm very happy about that. As always, you can find us on social media at The Adventurelings on Instagram. That is where we are constantly updating people with pictures, progress on the next episodes, <laughs> funny stories of the recording process that don't make it to the show. And of course, feel free to visit us at theadventurelings.com and send us an email, theadventurelings yes. at gmail.com. We would love to yeah. hear all of your opinions, even if you don't always like the same things we like. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I'm only kidding. I'm open to all opinions, mostly. <laughs> all right. Hey, Mason, something we forgot, our next episode. Oh, yes. <laughs> so the next movie that we're going to be doing is the great martial arts film, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Yes. Yeah. I am very excited. It's getting some renewed love as well, since we have Michelle Yeoh Ugh. getting her well-deserved yes. moment. And it's also being re-released in theaters at this time. Is it? it is. So. <laughs> <laughs> getting, timely yeah getting a chance to look at it again through kind of the lens of the past 20 years yeah and since it really meant a lot to a lot of people when it was released and you know now means a lot to modern viewers yeah i'm mm-hmm. really interested to see what it was like because i don't remember it too too well mm-hmm. i remember the feelings of watching it but not you know as much the content of the movie which right is sad, but I'm very excited to rewatch it with you this next week. Yeah, me too. I mostly remember the beauty of the cinematography mm-hmm. and then Michelle Yeoh. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and of Chow Yun Fat as well. Fat. Oh, yes. The two of them, you know, obviously like such stellar, stunning performers. I'm also excited to do an international movie. Mm-hmm. I feel like there are so many more that we're going to be exploring next season, but it is really nice to get a super solid one in this season as well. Yeah. So I'm excited. It's going to be good. Awesome. Well, I can't wait. And I will talk to you next time on (laughs) The The Adventurelings. Sibling mind meld. (laughs) (laughs) Emily, oh my God, let me fucking finish my sentence. Sam, cheers. (laughs) Even worse than my sentences, don't finish my fucking bits, Mason. (laughs) I'm kidding. kidding. The best. Do you wish me the best? (laughs) Can we not do that? Let's do a different thing. Why didn't I read this out loud first? That's so hard to say. And we get a fun montage. Montage. (laughs) Montage. (sighs) Heckner Faulkner is a difficult name to say, but... Heckner? Hector? Heckner Faulkner is a hell of a name. That's true. All right, I might need to (laughs) re-record. No, I like it. We're going to keep it. (laughs) His surprisingly hostile child wear... Fuck. Jesus fucking Christ. Okay. I want to have both long hair and short hair, but that is not an option as far as I am aware. Except in Florida, where you can have a mullet. <laughs> What's happening? Why? I know, I'm trying. I am. Okay. Words are just hard today. And they tear off in search of a search. No. Heck. Okay. You know what? Fuck it. Never mind. So I think Taita's. T- God! <laughs> I forced that, and it was not pretty. Ugh, Lance, if you've made it this far, which I hope you have. I think that's a requirement. (laughs) I think he kind of has to.